Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burks and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. If you're interested in these programs, please join our membership. You can go to preservelincoln.org. Um, today is the 19th of a series of lectures with Jim McKee and the support for this series is provided by Speedway Properties. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. Jim has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J and L Lee Company. Jim has written over a thousand articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. And he is on the Nebraska State Historical Society Board of Trustees and also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. And Jim is also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Um, this is the 19th of a series of many talks get during the next couple of years. Um, the series is titled Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln and this is program number 19. Um, Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. Kind of fun to be the inaugural program for the new Historical Society Museum building. And we are sitting, you are sitting, I am standing in perhaps the last remnant, really, of the old Elks Club building. Everything else has been virtually torn out. Even the restrooms have been relocated. And finally, up on the second floor, the kitchen is gone. <laughs> part of it was still there with drains and everything. But the part you're sitting in is, was originally a half circle, and it was a bar. And if you, when you get up, if you stomp your feet, every other row you'll find is made of wood, and every other, other level is made of concrete. There were tables and this was a, a bar area. So kind of a historical setting in a way. And of all the things that are left in the building, I think this is it for the old Belts Club building pretty much. Uh, taking up today with the Lincoln Hotel building. Uh, in 1890 when the proposition was made that a new hotel be built for the city of Lincoln, there were already supposedly around 2,000 hotel rooms available. And so the idea of another hotel was, was scoffed at. I mean, it was already way more hotel rooms than we needed. Uh, and one man in the newspaper said, it will soon be as unwieldy as an elephant. However, the old Douglas Hotel site, which was on the southwest corner of 9th and P Streets, uh, became the site uh, primarily because most of, the rest, or most of the hotels wanted to be near the depot. Uh, this would be the site of the hotel. It's completed in 1891, seven stories tall, cost an amazing $350,000 to build, 223 rooms, 160 of which had a bath. Uh, there was also a billiard parlor in the building, a cafe, and of course that beautiful marble bal balcony and marble uh, entryway that a lot of you do remember. President McKinley was one of the people who stayed here. Uh, several governors actually lived in the building before there was what we call a governor's mansion or even a home for the governor. Uh, 1911, an annex was built to the left in this picture. Doesn't quite show, I guess, uh, to the south. Uh, now we're looking through the park which preceded the post office building looking towards the west. And you can see the addition in this building, the 1911 addition, which was almost as much as, as the original hotel cost. Uh, if you would take this picture and show it to somebody in New York, you could probably convince them, if they didn't look closely, that you were actually in, in New York City and this was Central Park looking out on it. Um, ultimately, the building will be purchased by Eugene Epley, uh, also owned by Bennett Martin later on. Uh, he also owned, Epley owned the Capitol Hotel in Lincoln and the Lincoln Hotel. Uh, Lindell, excuse me, so the Lindell, the Lincoln, and the Capitol all were on Eugene Epley in Omaha. Uh, 1933, when Epley bought uh, the Lincoln Hotel, uh, his was the largest privately held ho hotel chain in the world. Uh, out of Omaha, he had 44 hotels. 1956 was purchased by the Sheraton Hotel Company. Uh, in that time, uh, Bennett Martin built the building, leased it to the Sheraton, under a guarantee, uh, and that is not something you want to do because it didn't necessarily work very well. Also, through the years, KFOR Radio and KFAB Radio both had studios in here. This is the ballroom, which was uh, on the second floor over in the southeast corner of the building. We're standing on a stage looking towards the east in this picture. 
And Matt, this is where the Nebraska Numismatic Association used to hold their annual meetings in this room. The lobby, which was quite spacious, of course, uh, on entering from the 9th Street side, we're uh, looking in this picture, we're looking towards the northwest, the large staircase to the right, uh, and a really nifty picture of that lobby. Uh, the thing that I remember about the lobby, may, maybe more than anything else, was up on the balcony. There were huge paintings, uh, probably uh, 20 feet long and equally um, proportionately tall. Uh, and when they tore the building down, ultimately in 1972, a couple of those paintings ended up with an antique dealer in Beatrice who still has them. So if you'd like to have them, he hasn't found any place big enough that anybody's interested in them. But I remember those interesting... Uh, huge paintings up there. One was of Napoleon and so forth. And they also had an atmospheric clock that you didn't need to wind as the atmospheric pressure would change up and down as more or less a bellows would operate, would wind the clock. And that clock, although it's no longer operative, is in the Lincoln Public Library, which of course Ben and Martin also is responsible for. So this is looking towards the uh, west and no, the staircase would be to the right. So in this picture, we're looking towards the uh, east, I reckon. The staircase on the right, later on, there will be a restaurant underneath the staircase, uh, which is known as the, for a while, the Intercom Club, which will move over to the Cornhusker Hotel. And it was kind of a, not a secret uh, facility, but you entered just through a very small door that was unmarked. So it was a private club. And I remember one night the, the uh, Baker Street Irregulars were meeting in there and I stumbled into it not knowing what was going on. 1972, the building is torn down, owned by, at that time, Bennett Martin, who will build the Lincoln Hotel, uh, which will later um, become the Ramada. And up along the top, all the way around to the penthouse up there were uh, the words Ramada. Uh, and I remarked to the manager at that time, I said, was there ever a time in history where all four of the signs were operative at the same time. And he said, not so far as I know. Because if you look up, you'd see the Ada, or the Rom, or the Rama, and they never worked. Uh, one of the things we didn't mention earlier on uh, were the four penthouses up on the top. Uh, those were accessible, not by elevator. So if McKinley, if McKinley lived up there, or stayed up there while he was here in Lincoln, he would have ridden the elevator to the top floor, and then one of the people like Mr. Rodney would have walked his suitcases and up to those top floors. A little bit unusual, you'd think, for what would be the most prestigious room in the hotel. Uh, sometime in the probably the 50s, the two uh, balconies were removed, first one and then the other side, uh, removed by direction of the state fire marshal. Uh, so they came off and they made the building look a little bit less attractive than it does. Let's see, let's go back here. What, yeah, you can actually see in this picture, right in the left middle ground, is the salt water fountain, uh, which we talk about being built in that block originally. Okay, and there it comes down to 1972. And now, of course, the site is the Holiday Inn, uh, and when the Holiday moved in, they also have a parking lot, which is attached to it. It takes up about a half a square block now. Shogo Lithia Springs was a bottler in Lincoln, uh, bottled soda water primarily, and by that I don't mean many flavors, although they were to add them later on. It was primarily a mineral water which had a lithium base, so it was Lithia Springs. Uh, and lithium is a great um, drug, if you will, uh, sort of a soothing uh, thing if you're uh, nervous or anxious. Uh, lithium is still given sometimes as a drug. So the lithium which came out of the water, which was at Milford, and the springs were located approximately where the Southeast Community College is today. Springs, as far as I know, still leach into the ground. Uh, the legend was that there was an old Pawnee Oto chief whose name was Quinchada, which was a made up word. Uh, Quinchada being, you know, what good for you to drink at Milford. And they would ship the water uh, to Lincoln where it was bottled. And during the construction of the Panama Canal, bottled water from this spring was also shipped to the canal zone for use of the people that were working there. So bottled water is nothing new. Uh, at Milford, they also built a sanitarium above the springs uh, simply because it was a curative. 
1920, the land became the county poor farm. And before that, however, in the 1890s, that it had been a soldiers and sailors home. Um, and then in the 1940s, it was taken over by Southeast Community College. Nothing has left, although they, they tell me you can still go to the uh, banks of the creek and find the spring still seeping out this lithium water. Uh, in Lincoln, this was located in what I'll call the South Haymarket District, uh, in the same block that uh, Meadow Gold's in, and uh, it would be on the east portion of the block and primarily on the northeast corner of the block itself which would make it the southwest corner of the intersection that's always, always confusing uh, but anyway it's been torn down uh, and nothing has left of, of shogo lithia there in 1910 the production facilities was bought by a man in lincoln with a morris friend uh, who also was a major holder in a little company in lincoln called beatrice creamery um, the address would be, uh, no, his office would be on South 11th, un unimportant. Then about 1918, it was bought by the Rorig family. And when I was a kid, the Rorig family had liquor stores around town, so, but the same family. Uh, then in 1955, the same company was bottling Shogo Lithia as owned the Dr. Pepper franchise. So still being bottled in the 1950s. Uh, the back of the block, and probably all of the block, now I'm not certain, is owned by Jabrisco, which is Laszlo's, which is Empyrean Ale. Uh, they own a, a, bil a business in either your, uh, Ashland or Greenwood, which they're moving into that business first, which is uh, a business which demagnetizes files primarily for the federal government. A, a big business with big magnets. Uh, that's going in there, but this, this building is long gone. And if you shop in antique stores, you still see the Shogo Lithia pressed glass bottles quite frequently. Went the wrong direction, technology. <laughs> this uh, is the corner uh, where now we have Wells Fargo. I have to always stop and think because I want to call it the National Bank of Commerce Corner. Uh, banks change their name so fast, sometimes you have to stop and think. This is to be the southwest corner of 13th and P Streets. Um, J.F. Lansing came to the city of Lincoln in 1872 and purchased the three lots on the corner of this intersection. Uh, and he then built three houses on the property. They weren't to stand too long, however. Um, in 1888, he announced that he would tear down those houses as soon as Lincoln got around to paving that far east. So, so it's going to be a ways away. Yet. But finally, November 23rd of 1891, uh, this building opened at a cost of $200,000 to build, not quite as big as the Lincoln Hotel, but it seated 2,200 people, which would make it a very good sized auditorium by today's standards, plus room for 500 people standing as well. It was made of Lake Superior stone, so it was a substantial building. Uh, the interior walls were about 16 inches thick. Some of the exterior walls were running 24, 24 inches thick. And the reason for the interior walls being that thick was the auditorium of the theater was separated from the offices around it by thick walls so that sound would not permeate uh, from one end to the other. It was lit originally by 1,000 electric jets. So 1891, this was just about the time that Lincoln was getting electricity. Why they called them jets? I think it's probably just a holdover from gas lighting. Uh, an electric jet really doesn't have much mean, meaning, but uh, on the other hand, if you've ever heard anybody say that they're talking about firing up their computer, that doesn't make any sense either. Uh, no more sense than it does going to the ice box. Uh, but nonetheless, some of those terms straggle on, and I think it's probably what happened. Uh, inside the building, and we can see the exterior rather clearly, and we'll want to get a couple more pictures, I think. Uh, on each side, there were five boxes in three tiers. Uh, so three tiers of five boxes each. There were also six balconies in the building. They said, however, they could evacuate the entire theater in less than two minutes should a fire ever occur. Uh, they did not ever have to test that, fortunately. The building was probably the first building in Lincoln to be air conditioned, certainly one of the first buildings in the state of Nebraska. Uh, they blew air over ice cakes. Uh, and then circulated that rather moist air uh, through 70 vents within the auditorium itself. The stage, which was on the south end or the P Street end, uh, was 66 by 36 feet or 36 feet tall, so a very tall stage. Um, they could accommodate anything that you wanted to put in there, an elephant act or anything else could be accommodated on the stage. In the basement, 
Uh, there was a barber shop, 12 dressing rooms, and a bear pit, so that if you did bring wild animals for your vaudeville act, they had a place to stay. And also a fuimor, F-U-I-M-O-R. So architects all know what a fuimor is, I presume. <laughs> uh, another term which has gone completely, but it was a men's smoking room. So every, every major building would have had one, certainly the theaters would have. By 1895, the two brothers-in-law that operated the building uh, fell out, uh, and in 1895, the theater itself was sold to the Crawfords in Topeka, Kansas. They renamed it from being uh, originally the Lansing Theater to the Oliver Theater. Oliver was the first name of one of the partners. Uh, on the corner, a little bit later on, was the uh, Liberty, because it going to change its name again from the Lansing to the Oliver to the Liberty. Uh, this is the Liberty uh, drugstore which was on the corner and in there you could buy a limeade for a nickel or two packages of old golds for a quarter. So you know you could take care of all your sins in one spot or you could come down from the movie take your date here and have a limeade on the cheap. Later on this will become the site when I was a kid of uh, a piano and organ studio. And written up in the Lincoln Journal at that time was the piano studio uh, had the largest incidence of shoplifting ever recorded in the city of Lincoln. Uh, when they would go to lunch, they left just one person involved uh, to uh, keep the build business running. Uh, McCabe was the piano and organ company. Uh, and a guy pulled up his truck over on the alley side and went into the back room. And it was only one person on duty. And he just said to this gentleman, is that the piano? And the guy says, yes and they loaded it up <laughs> and away went the piano. Uh, so shoplifting history was made in the building. So it became the Liberty in 1920 after World War I. Uh, then in 1941 it'll get the name the Varsity, which is how I remember the building. And here it is coming down. Uh, the tenants, which were above on the second story of the building, which surrounded the auditorium, included the Nebraska Dental College, which moved from 15th and 0 to this building before moving over in the 20s into Andrews Hall on the university campus downtown and then ultimately moving to the east campus. Also for a time, the Lincoln City Library was in this building. Uh, when their building and the old Masonic Temple burned down, they moved here temporarily. Uh, Molzer Violin Studio was in here, and Molzer's move here and there and everywhere, and they're over in the Nebraska Orpheum Theater a little bit later on as well. Um, two of the people who appeared in vaudeville or stage productions here, which you would recognize their names, and hundreds of people did, of course, but Ethel Barrymore and George M. Cohen were two of the performers that came here. 1972, a good year for tearing things down, it sounds like, uh, they tore down this building to make way for the National Bank of Commerce. And we won't see the construction of the National Bank of Commerce until slide tray seven or eight, and this is slide tray number five, just in case you think we're about done with all this. Here it is, is the Varsity, the same old building, uh, but with a new uh, sign, a new marquee out on it. Uh, it was said when the building originally stood that it had a huge lobby in it that you could drive a horse and six into the 13th Street side, into the lobby, turn them around, drive out onto the P Street side and never brush the walls. I have no recollection of that because the time I was a kid, uh, the lobby had constricted itself and about all there was room for was to turn yourself around and buy a bag of popcorn. But it was a nickel. So, gone in 1972. Uh, this is Castle Roper and Matthews. Tom, a picture it looks kind of familiar to you. On the right would be the Sharp Building, and on the left is the uh, Finney Building. This was built by Dr. Finney, who built the building on the left, and I think we'll see it a little bit more in another picture. But Castle Roper and Matthews started about 1901, but not in the city of Lincoln. Uh, a man by the name of Charles Roper started in 1901 with a partner. Uh, by the name of Clark Beecher, and they were located in University Place, Nebraska, a separate city at that time. Uh, they planned the mortuary to be downtown. However, they wanted a mortuary to be in a place where it was accessible to streetcars and Wayuka Cemetery. So this was the site they chose on uh, N Street, between 13th and 14th on the south side, a beautiful terracotta building. Uh, and, this was, and that's the reason it was where it was, because you could catch the streetcar there. Uh, they also had a mortuary at 132 West St. Paul Street in University Place, which was a small frame building 
which was only torn down probably, I say only, but only 20 years ago or so. Uh, it was used for storage, and uh, in fact, they were using it to store coffins in for quite a bit, and then uh, a man had a carpentry studio in it on the north side of the street there, long since gone. In 1903, Mr. Uh, Beechler sold his interest to a man of the name of Castle, and at that point in time, it became Castle Roper, and then Jack Matthews joined the firm uh, a little bit later on in the early part of the 20th century, became Castle, Roper, and Matthews. Uh, 1911, uh, the building was built 1319 N Street, uh, and at that point in time they also had an ambulance service as well, and they kept their horses in the back, and I was mentioning earlier that they shared one small part of the Finney building next door where they had a horse wash, so that when you have to wash the hearse, you had to wash your horse as well, and they later will have an ambulance service, so there will be people uh, staying in the building 24-7 and answering ambulance calls as well out of the building. 1928, they opened a branch in Havelock in the Schmidt building, uh, which is catty corner from the Joyo Theater building, now has part of the great used furniture business in Havelock is in that building as well, uh, which was interestingly built as a Ford garage to start with. And I think we probably talked about that in Havelock when we started here about three or four years ago. Um, Maud Jenkins operated the Havelock Ranch. They had small branches scattered around near cities in the area as well. And in 1957, they will uh, leave this building and build a building out of 4300 O Street. Uh, and about that time, uh, Mr. Chambers died. And at that time, they also had a great glass-fronted um, mortuary, a hearse. Nope, we don't have it. Uh, which I asked uh, Max Roper about, oh, well, maybe 20 years ago. And he said they still had that glass-sided uh, hearse, if you will. And you've seen pictures of them. They're all heavily, not leaded glass, but beveled glass, uh, horse-drawn. And I said, so could someone then hire that today? And he said, yes, they still had it. Nobody wanted it, uh, but they still had it. And of course, they're now located right next to Waiuka Cemetery. And I always thought, that'd be the way to go if you've got to go, is to, to go in that uh, horse-drawn, glass-sided mortuary. Uh, hearse, if you will. About um, 1886, David Eugene Thompson. All right, Matt. <laughs> yes, I always want to call him Donald. And Matt always likes to correct me, but I, I think it's David Eugene Thompson. Why I think he should be Donald, I don't know. But David Eugene Thompson arrived. 1886. Uh, he became the general superintendent of the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad's Western Division, which made him the vice president of the Union Pacific Railroad, or Burlington Railroad, excuse me. In 1892, he built this house on the southwest corner of 15th and H Street. So it puts it directly across the street from the Capitol building. Today, it's um, the back or the side yard of the governor's mansion, if you will. Um, 1902. Um, Mr. Thompson was a close friend uh, of a man uh, under Vice President McKinley who was running for, er, McKinley was running for president, excuse me. And so he uh, came to Mr. Thompson and made him sort of his local campaign manager. And at that time, Mr. Thompson established the Star newspaper, 1902. He established the Star newspaper. Really, its primary reason for being at all was to promote uh, the presidency, uh, not of McKinley at that time, but Roosevelt, the Republican Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. So Thompson became the promoter of Mr. Roosevelt through the Star newspaper, uh, and Mr. Roosevelt was elected, and as thanks to him, uh, Mr. Thompson was made ambassador to Brazil, which meant he's going to leave the state of Nebraska. He offers to sell the house to the state of Nebraska little negotiation back and forth. Uh, the number that I have down is $25,000, and I'm not sure whether that's exactly where it ended up or not, but he wanted a little more, and the state wanted to pay a little less. Bob? What was the year again? Um, this would have been early 1902, 1903, right after he was president, so probably 03, but I'm not sure exactly, early, in, early on. You barely remember it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that's wrong, because he became, the, the brain is a terrible thing, because in 1905 is when he became ambassador. 
So probably it was a little bit later on, I think. Ambassador to Brazil. Okay. Uh, the House was then uh, the first governor moved in. It would have been, I think, Pointer, P-O-Y-N-T-E-R, would have been the first governor to occupy this as the first governor's mansion. Up until that time, governors either like Sam McKelvey would have lived in his own home on N Street, uh, or they would have lived in a hotel. The Tishner House Hotel was popular when it was still going. The Lincoln Hotel, I had two governors live in it. Uh, while they were well, they were governors, so this will be the first time we have a proper mansion. And the way I define a governor's mansion may not be correct, but I define a governor's mansion as being the home of the governor owned by the state of Nebraska. I'm looking for guidance on this and receiving none. <laughs> so, and Roxanne shaking her yes. So I'll presume that's correct. We'll go with that for the while. Um, later on, the house will be pretty much condemned, and Governor Anderson is living in the house. And Betty, Elizabeth Anderson, was afraid to live there any longer when the fire department condemned the furnace, which is probably a, a pretty good time to, to leave it. But Roger Anderson, their son, used the ballroom on the upper floor for his electric train layout. Uh, and I was never in the house as a friend of Roger's, but he never invited me up there uh, to see the electric train layout. So the house was pretty much uh, abandoned when Governor, became, Governor Anderson became the uh, governor of Nebraska. And he would then move in and be the first person uh, to move into the new mansion. Roxanne. Did that porch go all the way around the house? No, I think it is only on the north elevation and the east elevation is my understanding of it. I don't have any pictures of the back, but we'd have to look in a Sandburns fire map uh, to make doubly sure. But I think it was only on two, two elevations. Um, uh, towards the end, uh, before they finally declared the house unfit, uh, because the furnace wouldn't ignite. Uh, the fire department really didn't like this house at all for anything for the governor to live in because it was only one stair only one staircase up to the ballroom. Does it soothe to the visitor's desk? Does it soothe to the visitor's desk? Okay, we'll have to be talking to somebody about that. <laughs> uh, the only one staircase up and we're in case staircase down. So in case of a fire, uh, it was not ac accessible and the state fire marshal didn't like the building at all. But the interesting thing was, uh, when Governor Anderson moved into the new governor's mansion, he used the same key to unlock the same mechanism uh, for the front door that Governor Pointer had used to let himself into the mansion originally when it was here. So they did save a few things for the new mansion. Uh, and the striker, the plate, and the key, keying mechanism were one of the things that moved over. Um, we do have a few interior pictures of this building, but not too many. Um, 1958 is the new governor's mansion date, I believe. And one of the things that was saved uh, was the paneling on the staircase went over to the new mansion, and I think it's also against the uh, staircase to the second floor. Uh, very few things were salvaged, and in fact, when the old building was torn down in the late 50s, one of the things they allowed any taxpayer in Nebraska to do, and, I, and by that I mean anybody that would wander in, I think, probably, you could take anything you wanted. They had already pulled out the cupboards and sold them, uh, but you could take a piece of carpet or a piece of molding or something like that, free of charge. And Roger and Victor Anderson had, from the spindles on that staircase, made gavels. Uh, and I have one of them, a pretty good sized gavel with a nice letter from Victor Anderson saying that uh, that's what it is. But there were, obviously there were a whole lot of uh, gavels made. I don't, it's not unique by any manner. This is the dedication of the new governor's mansion. Uh, this is the day when they allowed people to come and uh, tour it. And the thing that, if you're old enough, you remember is that one of the things that the subsequent governor said was the floors shake. Uh, Summer Solheim is a designer of the building, and they had to go back in. Oh, Summer Solheimer, <laughs> we were talking about earlier, Jim, uh, had to go in and reinforce the second floor with a steel beam or two, I think, to keep the building from uh, shaking a little bit. Mr. Thompson also gave the city of Lincoln what's called sometimes the Thompson Fountain. Um, and about 1930, this stood in dead in the middle of the intersection of 11th and J. So we really had our first traffic circle at that time. Nobody knew it, of course. Uh, and one uh, gentleman who was a wholesale grocer in the city of Lincoln, who shall remain nom uh, nameless at this point, uh, liked to both drive his new automobile and he liked to tipple. 
and he liked to tipple and drive his automobile at virtually the same time. Fortunately, he never, ever texted and drove, though. <laughs> but he twice, apparently, drove his automobile into the side of the fountain. Uh, so it will be picked up and moved uh, as a traffic obstacle. You know, pave over the fountain, and here it is. They're going to move it to Antelope Park, where it will become uh, just a waiting fountain for a time. The center section, which is called the Neptune Fountain, that was made of scrap metal, or made into scrap metal, which supposedly was sold uh, in the late 30s to Japan. And I said, it's possible that some of that scrap metal then came back to Lincoln uh, in the form of shrapnel in people's bodies, but who knows, kind of bizarre, if true. When it was moved to Antelope Park, it later on, by the way, will become the Cota Mundi habitat, which in the children's zoo then uh, will be over, clear over in the uh, northeast corner. And I think it's now gone as well, but the, the round circular stone part was there and they hollowed it out in the middle and made it a Cota Mundi habitat. Now Cota Mundi is kind of like a small bear, best way to describe it. But I think it's gone now. Uh, a lot of fountains have survived, but I think that one is gone. Uh, this is the house of Frank Zerung. Uh, supposedly at the time, it was the only true townhouse in the city of Lincoln. Exactly what makes a townhouse a townhouse uh, is a little bit unclear. It was a 1225 P Street, which if you think of it, today would be where the drive-in facility for the Wells Fargo Bank is on P Street. Mr. Zerung had graduated from Lincoln High School, gone to the University of Nebraska, and was a pharmacist in the city. Uh, he also managed the Funk Opera House, which was on the southwest corner of 12th and O Streets, later the site of Kresge's and today the site of uh, the Centrum uh, Shopping Center. Good luck in buying anything in that shopping center. But uh, you can see on the back there, his stable says the Zerung uh, Company, and the Zerung Company was an outdoor billboard company. So they had billboards scattered around. He also is going to become the manager of the Liberty Varsity uh, Lansing Theater, which is to the left in this picture, just sort of the small alley going back to that. And when he's the manager, he will knock a hole in the back of the theater uh, on the alley, which will connect to that building so that they were able to store scenery and so forth for the theater in his uh, garage or barn behind the house there. Uh, so he managed both the Lansing and Liberty and also the Funk Opera House. Then uh, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, we talked a minute ago about the uh, other houses being torn down around there, and they tore down the livery barn at, at that point in time, the early part of the 20th century. Uh, Mr. Zero was the mayor of the city of Lincoln as well. And Chris Beitler is now elected for the third term, is that right? But Chris Beitler was not the first three-term mayor of the city of Lincoln. Mr. Zerung was. But Mr. Zerung, who was the 22nd mayor of the city of Lincoln in 1912, uh, then didn't become mayor again until he was the 25th mayor of the city of Lincoln in 1921. Then he didn't become mayor again until he was the 28th mayor of Lincoln in 1931. So Chris would be the first mayor to have three consecutive terms, but not the first uh, three-term mayor. The house itself was purchased in 1955 by uh, National Bank of Commerce, the stewards. They will tear the house down, and it will become uh, the first drive-in bank in the city of Lincoln, associated, of course, with National Bank of Commerce. Uh, today, there's still a drive-in bank there, uh, and that drive-in bank has uh, uh, underground walkways, which go over to the bank itself. Uh, signifying nothing. Robert? Was that building right on the street, the sidewalk? The building, uh, uh, he asked, was it right on the sidewalk? The fence in front of it was the sidewalk line. Uh, and I can remember as a kid the gate being closed. I don't know whether the gate was the same height as the fence or not, but I remember looking up at that gate and thinking how, how tall it was. Uh, and the only other thing I remember about it was there was some scandal of some sort. I never understood it. I would have been, you know, just 12 years old, something like that. But the scandal was, people said, he had a Philippine houseboy, you know. Well, I don't know what that meant, but, <laughs> but it was a great scandal at the time. 
uh, down, it, down it came, and of course the Ram Park building will be built directly to the right, uh, where there was a two-story building as well. The Lincoln City Auditorium, uh, owned by the City of Lincoln. In 1896, the lots on the southeast corner of 13th and M were purchased by Lancaster County, uh, who bought those three lots for $13,654. The county bought them. February the 12th of 1900, the Lincoln City Auditorium opened, as we see it here, with a concert by the highest paid performer in the world at that time, Ian Paderewski. Uh, people came from as far away as the Panhandle uh, to even having to pay the exorbitant price of one dollar for a ticket and was completely sold out. It was a very hot day, even though it was February the 12th, and uh, uh, not air conditioned, certainly. The stage on the building was on the other end, the east end, and it was fitted with movable seats. Uh, there's a picture. We're standing on the stage now, looking towards the west. The Cornhusker Hotel uh, would be later on right across the street. But the seats would move so they could also set it up for banquets, uh, roller skating, anything like that that they wanted. And I think the next picture will show it up as a uh, setup with a banquet in it. We're looking now again towards the east with the stage on that other end. And it was kind of a Quonset building, a rounded roof with wooden supports. April 15th of 1928, the University of Nebraska uh, was holding their annual Cosmet Club Review in the building. It was held over one night uh, and on April 15th, just after it closed, after one extension of a night, uh, the auditorium burned to the ground. Uh, at that time, it becomes a very puzzling period because the land underneath it is owned by the county. The building is owned supposedly by the city, but the fire insurance policy is owned by the American Legion Club, with the beneficiary being the county of Lancaster. Uh, it begins a rather interesting period in there because the American Legion wanted to rebuild the city auditorium on the spot, but they had no uh, money. Uh, and ultimately, the American Legion Club is going to end up with the land under it as well, whether it was a purchase or what, is unclear. Uh, so it's going to sit empty for a while. And in 1939, uh, the voters of Lincoln approved a 10-year bond, $75,000, uh, to build a new auditorium, 1939. The bonds proved unsaleable. Uh, World War I, II came along and they proved unsaleable. And it was at this point that uh, there begins to be a discussion about not building the auditorium downtown, but instead building at 33rd and O Street on the uh, Woods or Rogers Tract, which is now open except for the tennis bubble and swimming pool, still pretty much an open tract of land. Uh, Nathan Gold and the O Street uh, magnates downtown said no, uh, the auditorium needed to be downtown. Uh, okay, um, the old site. Um, ultimately will be purchased by Ed O'Shea to build the bus depot on it. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the site was three times they tried to build the auditorium there. And once, uh, the question even went to the Nebraska Supreme Court, uh, and they said that they had sold, ultimately sold the bonds to build the new building here, uh, but they were uh, questioned then in the Supreme Court saying that the way the bonds were sold stated specifically that the auditorium uh, would be built downtown and now they're talking about using the money to build a auditorium at 33rd and O Street and so the Nebraska Supreme Court said they could not sell the bonds so ultimately it just keeps tossing back and forth um, and ultimately Ed O'Shea will buy the property. He had a terrible time getting clear title to all the land, as you can imagine, uh, between the county and the Legion Club and the city of Lincoln, but he finally did get a clear title to it and built the bus depot building, which stands there today. The bus depot was on the ground floor, the upper two floors had um, parking, and also on the east end there is a garage for repairing automobiles as well. And if you would look at that building today, from 13th Street looking towards the east along the alley, you will see a rather interesting uh, area right along the alley, which is roughly the width of a bus, 
which runs inside the edge of the building and then connects to the alley. And that's where the buses pulled in and unloaded, so they were completely out of the weather. Um, and the entrance to the bus depot was primarily towards the north, and there was a huge newsstand in there. They used to carry newspapers from like 30 different uh, cities in the United States, magazines, quite, quite an elaborate thing in the bus depot. But of course, that's long, long gone, and now it is shops on the ground level, and upper two floors are all parking, but you can still see that remnant of where the buses were brought in to unload along the south side of the building. Uh, in 1941, um, the old block which had originally held the Lincoln High School, which had been uh, just torn down a bit before that, or the remnants of it, um, that was purchased by the city of Lincoln, then in square block over there. Uh, purchased by the city of Lincoln, they tried to issue bonds then to build the auditorium there, and they couldn't sell them. Uh, they were unsaleable again. Uh, ultimately, March 10th of 1957, that block will become the new city auditorium, uh, Lincoln's Pershing Municipal Auditorium. Of course, the building is still there, but uh, for all intents and purposes, it's empty. Uh, so from 1928 till roughly 1958, uh, lacking a few months, that we had no Lincoln City Auditorium. The fire was so hot that it threatened the to the left and there's a hotel right there called Waverly Place and just we're looking towards the south and just behind it was the Roman Catholic High School which is called the Cathedral uh, and it sat right there. The flames were so hot that sparks jumped they thought it might catch the high school on fire, the hotel on fire or even the Cornusker Hotel across the way but uh, well it did a fine job on the auditorium. No other fires came of it. Instead another auditorium is going to be built but this will not be a Lincoln City owned auditorium. Uh, this will be owned by a man who lived out in College View who had supposedly been convinced by some friends that he could make a fortune by having a city auditorium. Uh, we're looking here, uh, this is the corner, would be of 11th and M, and we're looking towards the southeast, and we can see peaking above it on the top there, uh, the dome of the uncompleted Capitol building, just barely up on the top, upper left-hand side there. Uh, Lincoln Auditorium Building to continuing down the street to the south we would run into um, the Green Gateau or across the alley if you have a hard time picturing it. Um, this picture taken about 1930 uh, the building still stands uh, and it probably you wouldn't recognize it if you didn't know what it was. It was only in operation for a few years and the guy that operated it independently as a city auditorium said the only time he even broke in, broke even, excuse me, was when he had it set up as a roller skating rink. This is the building roughly today. This is an old picture, but this is roughly what the building looks like today. Uh, in this picture, we have the general uh, tire store and today Enterprise uh, has a car rental in the building. Uh, Green Ghetto is the building to the right and what looks like to be a two-story building just this side of the alley is actually the fly for the stage. So this is where the stage of the original auditorium was. Uh, and even now with Enterprise in there, the stage is still there. Uh, and up on the stage, the last I was in there, they had kind of an employee coffee room, lunch room sort of a thing. But clear into the 1980 era, if you went into there, the scenery was still up in the top of the fly. So what became of that, I don't know, because it's gone now. Uh, and they've gone in several times and tried to work on the uh, southernmost portion of the building to make it a leasable uh, area. They put new glass doors on it, but nothing has ever come of it. And still, the interior, you can go inside and still see literally where the old auditorium was. There are a few little uh, remnants on the outside that you look carefully, you can see for example, these faux stone, they're just actually cast concrete uh, pillars. They've been painted over, so they sort of disappear into the um, sort of stucco on the building. And it just keeps getting cobbled up and cobbled up, so I presume not too distant future. We'll probably put up a six-story student housing apartment. <laughs> now, this is the hotel, which stood directly adjacent to the auditorium. The auditorium would be on the left in this picture, so we're on 13th Street. Uh, looking, looking directly towards these, the Waverly Hotel. This will become the site of a parking garage, then a bank and a drive-in facility for a bank. And I don't, I think it's the U.S. Bank, but you know, there again, it's banks change their names too often. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. 
I don't know. What, and there is a tunnel from that bank over to the um, from departments from the parking lot to the bank too. I understand, but I've not been in it. So the Waverly Place, 334 South 13th Street, small hotel, 76 rooms, uh, but it was configured so that all rooms faced the outside. They all had windows on them. Uh, it was a 75 cent a day rental or a dollar. What you got for the extra dollar or extra quarter, I don't know. Uh, but you didn't have to pay that much if you wanted to stay for a week or a month. They had special rates. And they advertised hot water in all rooms all the time. A real, real treat. So this building came down basically shortly after the fire, but not because of the fire. The Chamber of Commerce. Um, July 28th of 1870. Uh, is an interesting date for several reasons. It's just after, in July, the first Burlington and Missouri River Railroad train will arrive in the city of Lincoln, giving it its first railroad, July of 1870. And on the 28th of July, the Lincoln Board of Trade, it was originally known, was uh, opened by a man by the name of Charles Gear. Uh, we know Charles Gear, of course, uh, from the library, but also he was the owner, editor, uh, publisher of the, what uh, became the Lincoln Journal Star. Uh, he formed the Lincoln Board of Trade, which met first at the old Methodist school, uh, which a, a church, which had been turned, to a, turned into a small frame school on the southwest corner of 10th and Q. <laughs> I have to stop and think about that. It's a parking garage now, uh, in the same block that the Lincoln Journal is. They met in that tiny little white frame Methodist church building originally in 1870. And they were formed for one reason only originally. And they were formed by Mr. Gear. The idea was Lincoln now has a railroad. They were formed to bring a second railroad and hopefully a third and fourth railroad to the city of Lincoln. The idea was that with more than one railroad, you not only have rail service, but you have competition. So the idea was to, for the city to have several railroads and form them for uh, competition. Uh, and also establish freight rates, which at that time were just kind of up in the air and whatever would work. Then in 1894, uh, after moving around here and there, they leased this house, the John Clark House, which was 1137 P Street. So between 11th and 12th on P, this would be well, we'll see what comes up in there in a minute, You'll, and the building is still there. Uh, Dr. Leslie, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Clark owned the property. They paid him $40 a month to lease his house. Uh, then in 1897, the Lincoln Commercial Club joined with the Lincoln Union Club and became the Union Commercial Club, uh, which will move to the fraternity building from here. And the fraternity building uh, is on Oh, well, this is just an interesting picture. Uh, this is the site, and uh, this house stood right next door to the, uh, to the Clark House. And the reason it's in here is a, is a second reason, which has very little to do with this program, but the building on the left right there is still there. Uh, this is the Walton Building. It was uh, built originally as an appurtenance to the hotel, which stood directly across the alley to the north. Um, and that building, uh, they've torn the bay windows off the front, and it stands directly behind what we call the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce building. Still there, uh, and it's empty now. Uh, it was owned, I think, by WRK, uh, who was going to lease it to uh, Gallup or one of their affiliates, but it fell through. So the building, they, after they kicked all the tenants out, it's now empty. And I think it's probably in danger of coming down. Uh, but it would be one of the oldest buildings in the downtown core, certainly. Uh, and on the corner was this other house next door to the Clark House. So this slide just kind of crept in there for no good reason. Uh, this is where uh, the Lincoln Union, Commer Commercial Union, Union Commercial Club will move to from Dr. Clark's house. This will be a building built by Mr. Sharp uh, and others, uh, and it's called the Fraternity Building and it is on the southeast corner of 13th and N Streets. Sounds all familiar. It's called the Fraternity Building, not because there are fraternities in it, but because one of the largest um, occupants of the building was a group of fraternal life insurance companies. Among them is Woodman, 
uh, which will combine and ultimately become a surety. Uh, but they're one of the companies that are in here. But this is where the Chamber of Commerce will go for a while. Uh, they go back to 11th and P, and that's where we would have seen that. These slides are slightly out of order. That's where that building was. Uh, then uh, they began by breaking ground for this building in 1912. Now you can see on the left-hand side of the picture, see the building with the uh, bay windows. That's the uh, what we call the uh, uh, building that's still there, the Walton building, named by Walton Ferris, uh, who was like the third owner of the building. Now WRK. Is that right, WRK? Do I have those letters right? Yeah. Uh, own the building today. Just doesn't have the bay windows on the front. So it's a very, very old building. Lincoln Commercial Club. And in fact, it says still Lincoln Commercial Club up on the top. Uh, they, of course, misspelled it and used a V instead of a U. But uh, interestingly enough, these uh, U's must not have been used enough because they never had enough of them to go around. They substitute the letter V quite frequently. In fact, there were, I think that's one of the things Mr. Johnson complained about the Capitol building, didn't he? That they had spelled something with a V instead of a U. Mr. Johnson complained about everything about the Capitol building, so I can't remember for sure if it was him. Uh, so in 1912, uh, they buy the property. In 1913, they break the ground for the new Lincoln Chamber of Commerce building, which they will build on that site at a cost of $175,000. Uh, later, uh, the building next door will be owned by Charles Dawes. Uh, Charles Dawes, of course, the Vice President of the United States. Charles Dawes also owned two of the corners of 13th and O. He owned the southeast corner and the northwest corner, uh, corners of 13th and O. So Charles Dawes uh, did own considerable property in the city of Lincoln. Um, so the building will be built. It has dining rooms, meeting rooms on the second floor, uh, mortician on the first floor, clear on the right-hand side, and a railroad ticket office in there as well. Uh, quite a few things in there. Uh, 1920, all these names become the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce, ultimately, so it becomes one group. Uh, 1925, one of the things that the Chamber of Commerce did was help uh, put together what became the Hotel Cornusker, the original building. Uh, they were instrumental in bringing the Veterans Administration Hospital to the city of Lincoln. Uh, they were uh, instrumental in building Memorial Stadium uh, and also the Lincoln Municipal Airport. So they had a lot of things going on in the building, but this building itself, uh, Robert, question. There appears to be a porch at the street level overlooking the It is not exactly a porch, and in fact, uh, the question was, is it a porch uh, there on the north elevation, or the south elevation of the building? Uh, not true porch, it's still there as far as I know. It's just, just really call it bal balustrade outside the windows. You might be able to step out on it, but it was not very wide, I don't think. But the interesting thing about the building today, I think, is let's look and see, is this is the uh, meeting room, which is on the second and third floor opened in there. Uh, and the last I knew, I'm not sure how it looks today, but you could stand at the Grand Theater and look at night up into that building, and they've lit it at night, and it's, they beautifully reconstructed it. Uh, it's really a great job. One of the owners now is uh, Miller and Payne, uh, the current owner of the building, I think, but WRK has their finger in it too, Robert. I was, I was referencing, and it may be just a reflection of the glass, the level below that is street level. It looked like there was a recess there. He's asking about a recess. Let's see if we can see. You mean the, the white stone sort of balustrade? I, I, if it was, if we, we could go out and look, <laughs> we, could, we could find out. Because they love to sell the building, and I found out that if you, if you pretend like you want to see the building, and for potential purchase, they'd love to have you come in. And Bob Campbell can get you in. He got the key for us the last time we went through there. My recollection is that you could not really step out on it. And there was a balcony, of course, and on the balcony here is where they would have a dance and they would have uh, tables up there. But we're looking here towards the northwest corner, so we would not see uh, the windows here. Later on, uh, Gallup and one of their companies was in there and they built a second floor. They put a floor across this so that they had, um, they cleared grocery store coupons in the building somehow. I don't know what was going on in there. And then later they came back and tore that out and made it look like it does again. Um, finally A.C. Nielsen was in there for a while too and they may have had the grocery store clearing house. 
A uh, lot of people have looked at it, but the upper floors are still empty. Misty's is on the ground floor, and that may be the only tenant on the ground floor now uh, of the building on the corner. So uh, that will put us at a good place to stop and see if there are any other questions now uh, before we adjourn from the day. Uh, questions? Comments? Corrections? Oh, we're out of time for corrections. We do have time for more questions, but uh, no corrections. Uh, if not, we will be back here again. Uh, next month in here will be Ed Zimmer. Uh, I'm not sure when we'll come back for the 20th, but uh, it will hopefully be back in this room. Uh, and I, one of the other things you notice when you walk out is, did I mention that every other floor is wood in here? So there were used to be tables in here, and this was a bar. And if you step down, if you step down, I think you'll find that you're on a wooden platform. I think you're on a concrete, so it's doubly wide. Uh, and we're maybe thinking we'll go back and tear out the wooden platforms, and by the time you get back next time, we'll have a, a bar in here, which will, you know, <laughs> it'll make everything I sound, say sound better at least. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>